To kick things off, the Swift core team is giving us an overview of what they're going to work on in 2023. As Swift grows, the core team is divvying up responsibility a little bit into work groups. This has been going on for a couple years now. There's like the language work group, the website work group, documentation work group, and there's other work groups as well. But essentially what this blog post does is each work group gives an overview of, you know, what they're going to work on or what they're going to focus on in 2023. So it's a good overview of the direction Swift is heading. So you can see the language development, right? There's going to be focus on concurrency, focus on generics, ownership, macros, We'll keep scrolling down and go through this quickly. Here's, you know, the compiler development teams. I don't really know much about compilers, so we'll skim over that one. But definitely check out this article, read it for yourself, pick out the things you're interested in. There's the implementation. A documentation work group right now that DocC is out, there are gonna be improvements on that. So that's gonna be a focus for the documentation work group. You know, the website work group, how are we gonna improve the swift.org website and then server-side Swift work group? What are they gonna work on for 2023? So again, if you want an overview of the direction Swift is heading for 2023, definitely check this one out. The Swift language has been open source since the end of 2015. And if you want to be on the cutting edge of Swift, you want to see the new features before they're officially released, you want to follow along the development of it, this is how you do it, the Swift Evolution website. So on the left, we have the color-coded status, essentially. So these proposals are an active review. I keep scrolling down. These are the proposals that have been accepted and will be implemented into the Swift language at a later date. And then we'll keep going down, you know, previewing, and these are the ones that have been implemented. So you can go back in history and see the proposals, the discussion around the proposals, around why a certain feature was implemented into the Swift language. So you can go back and get a little history lesson. But let's dive in a little bit to one that's an active review here. So add sleep for clock. Clock was something that was introduced in Swift 5.7. If you want to see what's coming in, you know, potentially Swift 5.8, 5.9, whatever the next version is, this is a good way to check that out. So if you click into this, this will take you to the GitHub proposal here. And I love this. This is broken down into so much detail to learn about clock and why we should add sleep for clock. So there's the introduction giving you background about, you know, what this even is. What is the motivation for adding sleep to clock? So you get to write up on the motivation in the code. And I'm just using this sleep for clock as an example. This is for everything that goes into the Swift language. You get this type of write up. And then, so we'll go to the motivation for it. And then here's the proposed solution with code examples and why you chose that stuff. And then normally there's alternatives considered. Will there be other code examples saying, hey, I tried this method. This is why I didn't choose to go this way for this implementation. So you can get more context on that. And then what I like about these features, if you go up to click on the pitch at the top, you can go to the Swift forums where this was originally pitched and you can see the discussion in the forums. Uh, so this is the original pitch and then you can see people are responding, hey, what about testing? And they ask questions about the proposal and it's a discussion to really hash out the pros and cons of adding this, maybe changing it a little bit. And sometimes these discussions in these forums can get heated depending on the topic. But like I said, if you wanna be on the cutting edge of Swift, you wanna see the features before they happen and take part in how Swift is evolving and growing over time, following the Swift Evolution website is the way to do that. Next up, Apple just announced the App Store Awards to celebrate the best apps and games of 2022. Now I wish there was a little blurb right up for each one, so I'm recommending this to you because I think it's more of a directory. So for example, the iPhone app of the year is Be Real. You just get one screenshot of it. <laughs> the iPad app of the year, Good Notes 5, one screenshot of it. The Mac app of the year, Mac Family Tree, one screenshot. So why I wanted to point this out is treat this as like a directory. If you are building an iPad app and you want to see what makes a great iPad app, you know, you'd have to do your own research into Good Notes. But like I said, this is a directory. You know, maybe you're working on a watch app. Hey, let me... Go look at, you know, gentler streak. What are they doing good that I can implement in my watch app? So like I said, I wish there was a blurb explaining, you know, why they were chosen and some of the things they did well, but it's still a good starting point for you to start your research to improve your apps. Moving on, we have an article from Ole Begeman, when animation animates more or less than it's supposed to. And essentially what this article is about is where you add your animation modifier in SwiftUI. So if you're familiar with SwiftUI, you know that the order of your modifiers matter because essentially each modifier creates a new view. So then the next modifier is a modifier on that newly created view to put it like super simply. So the order of the modifiers matter. And what Ole points out is there's a lot of cases where the animation modifier works as you would expect. Like I think he says right here, the uh, Yes, the unsurprising examples. These are like work as documented as you would expect. But it gets interesting because down here, 
a little lower, let's scroll, we get into the surprising examples, right? Now it's time for the fun part. It turns out not all view modifiers behave as intuitively as scaled effect and rotation effect when combined with the animation modifier. So he goes through what he calls rendering views and non-rendering views and how the animation modifier applies to them. So to sum this up, if you're having issues with the animation modifier, it's not like working, uh, you know, exactly how you would expect. Ole has dug in and pointed out that some views and view modifiers can be divided into rendering and non-rendering. That's his terms. He says he wishes he has a better term for these. And the placement of the animation modifier in respect to, you know, if it's uh, non-rendering or rendering, definitely matters. So if you're having issues with your animation modifier not working as expected, highly recommend checking out this article and hopefully it fixes your issue. I love it when a SwiftUI code snippet can fit in a tweet. And Italia has got a great one here. So if you need to permanently pin a view to the bottom of a screen in SwiftUI, you can place it inside the safe area inset edge bottom modifier. To be honest with you, I didn't know you could put views in this modifier. So this was new to me, but you can see the safe area inset edge bottom. You can put a text field in there and over on the right, you can see the image. I know Twitter's compression isn't great, but you can see that text field will be pinned to the bottom of the view and it will slide up with the keyboard. As you can see in a messaging app, that would come in handy and you can see the code is quite simple. Next up from our nod here, uh, how I made my app 73% lighter. And the main takeaway here is pay attention to the images you're putting in your app, whether it's a PNG, PDF, SVG, the size of it, you know, 800 by 600, you know, maybe you don't need it that big because the 3X size will make that 2400 by 1800 and that is, that is huge. So essentially what this article is about is his adventure into really diving into the images he was using in his app and the formats of them, the sizes of them and how it really saved a ton. So the, the punchline here is his app had bloated up to about 80 megabytes. And after he did this image optimizations, he got it down to you know, roughly 21 megabytes or, or 19 to 20. And he also found that using the new single size app icon, this new in Xcode 14, uh, helped a ton. So he gives some uh, rules to live by. This was interesting, don't use a JPEG. I didn't know Xcode generated a PNG, like no matter what, so you, you're better off optimizing yourself is what he says. Anyway, you can read it, but long story short is, don't just throw images into your app all willy nilly. Really be careful with that. Again, make sure they're the right format and make sure they're a reasonable size. I love this sentiment from Rob Napier, and that is pull requests are a story. Right? He says he's been thinking a lot about how to make PRs work better for teams. And a lot of my thinking has gone into show more compassion for the reviewer. This is huge. Many of you out there may not have ever reviewed a pull request. You know, you've submitted your pull request for review, but you've never been on the other side of it potentially. And early in my career, when that happened to me, when I became the reviewer, oh man, did that completely change the way I submitted my own pull request. I'll admit I was a culprit of the massive pull request. And if you've ever been a reviewer and you receive a giant pull request, you just, you just sink. You're like, come on. You know, it's just such a pain to review that. So aside from keeping your pull request small and reasonable, which is like the number one piece of advice I would give to someone, Rob has some great tips too. Tell them your story. What was the problem? What did you do to improve it? How did you know it was a working solution? What testing did you do? Why do you believe it was the right solution? You know, what are other ways you might have tried? He says, the code does not speak for itself. So tell the story, give them the context. That is so helpful. He says, even the most clear and readable code does not explain like why it is necessary. So that's a great tip. And then the last tip I'll leave you with here is read what you wrote. And that means before you submit your pull request, review it yourself. This is a habit I started doing a long time ago. And I would say probably 98% of the time when I review my own pull request, I find errors, issues, or changes I would make, or, or maybe it sparks an idea of how I would write something cleaner or better. It's an absolute must to proofread and review your own pull request before you submit it to others to review. I talk a lot about building your network as a developer, like on Twitter, or going to meetups, etc. What I don't have experience in is working at a large company and networking within that company. And Shreyas here has a great piece of advice for if you work in a company with many hundreds or thousands of employees. The best networking strategy actually lies in plain sight within your company. Here's a recommendation he gives. Ask a trusted colleague to name five people they know that are really great in your company. Reach out to them with a message. You know, of course not everyone will apply, but you know, share what you're working on. Ask about their work, build rapport, like kind of build, build those relationships. And he talks about, you know, that was his biggest regret at Google. Can you imagine working at Google for six years and not building up an insane network of Google engineers? Like that is very much a missed opportunity and that's what he says as well. So if you're working at a large company, yes, continue to network and build your relationships on Twitter or outside of work, but man, that big company is a huge resource as well. 
Let's talk about paywalls. Here we have a blog post from Jake Moore at Superwall. Uh, at monetization, two important metrics you probably aren't tracking. And I featured a Twitter thread uh, from Jake Moore a couple months ago on the show, like 100 tips for indie developers or something like that, or monetization. And one of the tips, a little controversial, he says, you know, show your paywall a lot more. And of course, you don't want to take that to the extreme. You don't want to spam your paywall as soon as a user opens the app. But I think a lot of us as developers tend to not want to bother the user, not want to spam them too much. And, and that's a good sentiment, but I think we can take that too far. So if on one end of the spectrum, we have spamming them every time they open the app, not great. The other end of the spectrum is not showing it enough because we don't want to bother the user. There's a happy medium that showing your paywall more often uh, will be really beneficial. And that's what this post is all about. And you get some data behind it. Essentially, showing the paywall more in increased sales it usually takes a user, you know, two to three times of seeing your paywall before they convert. There's all the data, all the article, all about that. But essentially, that's what it boils down to. Show your paywall more often, but do it in an intelligent way that makes sense for your app that doesn't, you know, cross over into the super spam to where you're just, people are going to delete your app. Apple has started doing Q and A's and they're great. So 10 questions with design evangelism. So these are questions that people ask Apple designers. And you can read through it, but I'm gonna pick out a couple. This one really resonated with me. How do you know when to start cutting features and make your app less cluttered and more user friendly? Especially as developers, I think we have the tendency to think, oh, my app's not selling or not doing well, not getting more downloads. Let me add more features. Let me add more, add more, add more, and more. That's kind of what we default to, but you know, there is something to be said about making your app a lot more simple and user friendly and figuring that out before you start adding features to it. So I thought that was like a, a great question. I do this all the time too. Is it considered best practice to limit device orientation on iPhone? I've done that many times where I'm like, not supporting landscape. Cause I do believe that in, well, I'm going against what, you know, the Apple people have said, they said you should really leave the device orientation up to users, you know, unless it doesn't make sense to your app. But I think landscape doesn't make sense in a lot of apps. <laughs> I think landscape has to really make sense to go through the developer overhead because if you've ever built an app that fully supports landscape, it's a lot of work to make sure every screen in your app looks good and rotates properly. So just make sure the cost of doing all that work is worth the benefit before you decide to do this. That's my take on it. But Apple says you should really leave that up to the users. One more I think is uh, pretty good here. Yeah, is it necessary to include tab bar labels for common tabs? So this has been a debate, right? If you look at certain apps, uh, they'll have their tab bar, but they won't have labels below the tab bar. And then it's always a question like, okay, well, should you have those labels below the tab or just rely on the images? And you know, Apple gives their answer here. And the big one here is, right? Labels are recommended for clarity and accessibility, right? If there's no label, the screen readers don't know what it is. So anyway, good Q&A about design from Apple. Hopefully we see a lot more of these Q&As coming soon. And finally, the LOL of the week, I'm just throwing it all at you. So Vincent, you know, has this meme account for iOS developer memes and he usually posts, you know, one of these memes. That's where I get a lot of my LOLs from, but he created a site now, Swift with Vincent, which is his own personal blog, and he has a meme section. So all the memes he has posted right here. So instead of giving you one iOS developer meme, I'm sending you right to the source. So go ahead, check out Swift with Vincent, the meme section, and have a good laugh. That wraps it up for the show. We'll see you next month.